I see it as there's a lake and that's, there's a lake, we'll start there. And there's a shed. And I think the shed more properly should be called a workshop, but I, I always call it a shed in my head. So the lake is where stuff just comes up out of. Um, and I've always imagined that there's something living in that lake that chucks me things. It just throws things up at me that I catch. And then I take them in the shed and I work on them. <laughs> so, but this is where things start getting a bit elaborate. So when I read my own writing, and often when I read other people's writing as well, I often think of it in terms of there's too much lake and not enough shed there. That, that wasn't worked on long enough. You didn't work on At other times, I think that's pure shed. You just, you know, you bang that up. There's nothing of the lake in there. So I have the best writers, the absolute, you know, the absolute pinnacle, they have an amazing lake and they have a phenomenal shed. Something that borders on a palace, right? In other words, they have extraordinary stylistic tools. They, they are amazing prose technicians, but they also have that bizarre ability to pull out the idea that no one else has ever quite done before or to extract the character who lives with virtually nothing done to it. I literally, I swear to you, I wanted to be a writer as long as I knew there was such a thing as a writer. But I have this very weird early memory, and I know I must have been four or under, because uh, that was the we left the first house that we ever lived in as a family when I was four, and I know it was in that house because I can just about remember it. And I couldn't write, but I was copying um, figure by figure, letter by letter, a story, and I just copied it out on a page. And I didn't know what I'd written, I'd just copied the words. And there I was very pleased that I had, I had made these, these marks on the paper. And I, I physically enjoy writing, I always have. And then I realised that, you, you know, books were made by people. I, I, assume, I can't remember realising that, but I assume I did. And I never, ever wanted to do anything else. Potter, really. I wrote other things. Um, I, I was constantly writing, I was always writing. And there was a novel called The Private Joke that I was writing for a couple of years. The premise of it I actually still really like, but I was too young to write the book that I wanted to write. Too young because I just didn't have enough life experience to credibly write these characters who were all in their sort of early 40s. It was just not gonna work, even though I still think the premise was decent. Before that, I was writing a different thing that was appalling. But you've got to write some appalling stuff. You go through phases, and when you're very young, you're back, and you imitate different people, and that, but that's good, that's healthy. And it was really only with Potter that I hit my stride, and I thought, oh, I can do this. This I can do, I could feel that I could do it. So, yeah, and I learned as I went. I don't know. I don't know where ideas come from. I think the more interesting question might be why do some people have, you know, why do some people want to live in a, a fictional world so much and why, why do some of us voluntarily spend hours and hours alone in a fictional world? But the trouble is I can't answer that question either. But that's maybe the more pertinent question. Some of us just are happy living that way, happiest living that way. Ideas come in different ways and different kinds of book um, form differently, that's been my experience. So um, with Harry, the idea really did cut, it, it was the idea for the story, the premise of the story came first, which was literally a child doesn't realize he's a wizard and, until he gets the letter. With other books, um, with the Ichabog, the word came, the word Ichabog came. I thought, what is that? What is an Ichabog? And that, that's how the story started, with me trying to find an entity to attach that word to. <laughs> um, and with the strike books, the character, the character came first, he came first. I did want to write what I saw as quite a golden age whodunit, but in a, in a modern setting. And it was interesting to think, well, how would that work? How do you in this 
age of DNA analysis and high tech, you know, high tech detective techniques and CCTV cameras. How do you have a real old school detective in modern London? And um, yeah, so he was really the starting point there. But Robin came very quickly afterwards, and then I became very interested in Robin. Uh, in the planning of the book, and I realise that this will be a two-hander. Um, she's not going to be Watson forever. We'll have two Holmeses. What would normally happen is I'm I'm working on a novel and I'm immersed in that novel completely, but I might... It will normally happen at a completely random moment when you're making gravy or something, and you'll have an idea for a different thing. So you run and find a notebook and then you lose the notebook. And, you know, if it was a good idea, it'll hang around. And if it wasn't a good idea, you'll find it in five years time. And sometimes I look through these notebooks and think, what on earth was that? What, what did you think you were gonna do with that? And then other times you have the idea and it sticks. And then it, you know, it grows like something in a Petri dish. And they're the ones that are worth something, the ones that really hang around. You almost didn't need to write them down. They're the ones that live in here. So uh, that's kind of a good rule of thumb, actually. If it's meant to be, it will it'll lodge up here. I learned a huge amount writing Potter. So even though this is a different kind of world building, I took all of the lessons I learned from Potter and applied them to the Galbraith books. I have a master files on all these different characters. I have huge amounts of back background just to keep myself orientated. You know, I know where Strite lived. I know a huge amount about his mother's history that I will never, never need to use. But sometimes you do need to use it. Sometimes you realize, hang on, hang on, hang on. We can put the, you know, this would thematically work really well here. So yeah, I, um, it sounds prosaic. It sounds like being a sort of, filing clerk or something for your own work but in a sense that's what you do you do you organize it all and you've got it there to refer to that's just the way I feel happiest working I've certainly met writers good writers writers I enjoy who have said to me I just see where the thread yeah. takes me I do a lot of the thread following in the planning stage by the time I come to write I really know what I'm doing. That doesn't mean to say there isn't room to have fun or isn't, there isn't room to go off on a little tangent here and there, but I really like the sense of knowing where I'm going. I think it will be a 10 book series. And so I have a very clear idea of how their relationship will go over those 10 books. So it sounds quite prosaic, it's, it's more exciting than that, but it, it sounds dull to think, well, in that book, the, that emotional milestone will be reached and, and so on. But you do sort of have to have those points of light along the way, you, because it gives it a very, sat, I think it gives it a satisfying rhythm. So on the one hand, I'm, I'm looking at their relationship, but, but then you have these discrete, these self-contained plots along the way, which are all formed in different ways because I had the idea for the second um, plot in the Strike series, The Silkworm, before I had the idea for The Cuckoo's Calling. Um, I reversed them because I thought The Silkworm would work better as a, a second book, as a, as a second case. The first one had to be something that he, you know, he had to make his name from to an extent just to move the character along. So a good example would be Lady Strike, um, Strike's mother. I know down to individual concerts that she ran away to go and see. I, <laughs> it was ridiculous. I spent hours on this stuff, you know, so I've got this huge long biography for her, where she ran away to, who she slept with, who she wanted to sleep with. The reason all of that's valuable is it's not because you're gonna use all of that. You're not gonna take four chapters to describe what Lady did when she ran away at 18. It's because you get such a sense of the person in creating that. I got to know her really well. And obviously she never appears in the books because she's dead, but she still casts a very long shadow over her children's lives. So yeah, I got to really understand her. One of the things I really love when you're, particularly when you're creating backstory for a character is, I often feel like, oh yeah, that's how it happened. It feels like discovery rather than creation. That often happens to me. 
And sometimes that happens to me with plot. I will hit a snag and I'll sit back, I'll mentally sit back. And then it comes and you think, oh yeah, of course that's how it happened. And it, but it feels like discovery. It doesn't feel as though I made it up. It feels as though I waited and then I, and then I saw it and it was there to be, I know this sounds very weird. But yeah, I often feel as though the, the right ideas feel as though you've discovered them. They were there waiting to be discovered as opposed to you actually creating them. I don't think a character has ever um, done that to me. Um, plots have some, I've sometimes, I, I've sometimes plotted it and then thought either that won't work or there is a better way to do this. And that often involves a lot of tinkering backwards and forwards because, you know, these things should fit together in a, in a satisfying way. You want it to fit together in a satisfying way. I really know my characters. Yeah. We have an understanding. They don't misbehave and I don't put them through too much hell. I absolutely love the planning process because you're, you're still in that, um, that amazing optimistic state where you think this will be the book that you're entirely happy with. This will be the one that you have no regrets about and, you know, everything is possible. All the pages are blank, so I really like that stage. And I have, I have various quotations about writing, um, actually, in my little loo in there, all around those walls, and I have two up here that I really like. And this one is by Faulkner, and it expresses it just perfectly. The work never matches the dream of perfection the artist has to start with. Never, never, never. So, but when, when you're in the planning stage, you can kid yourself, oh, this is, this is going to be the one. This is going to be great, this one. So, yeah, I enjoy that very optimistic stage. And, it, you know, I also I enjoy the craft aspect of it. I really enjoy the construction part of it. Um, and it, weirdly, as I've got older, I've enjoyed that more and more and more. Um, and I think um, I've sort of one writer, a very successful writer, who was the other way around, used to plan tons and now just doesn't feel they need to plot um, as meticulously. I've definitely gone the other way. So I used to do everything in notebooks, uh, and I still do use notebooks a lot. That was from Lethal White. So I end up drawing all of these. I like this, to be slotted in. <laughs> look at, but all these various, some of them are red herrings. Yeah, I look back and sometimes I can't remember what the hell I was writing at the time. But increasingly, I, I do a lot of planning on the uh, laptop. I'll show you what I do now. I used, to, I used to just hand write all these tables. So I've got red herrings. I always do clues in blue. It's just a reminder of where information is supposed to be given um, and different columns for strands of the story. Each row is a chapter, obviously. So yeah, and I always color code. So down the side, that means Strike and Robin are together. A, a sort of middle gray means it's just Strike on his own and a light gray means it's just Robin on her own. And it's a good way of seeing at a glance how much, how much page time each is getting. Because I like the balance. I like to shift between them a lot. And then when they're together, it's always, you know, stuff's always going on when they're together. So yeah, I do still use the notebooks, particularly when I'm traveling, obviously it's nice to be, have a book to just jot ideas down in, but, um, a laptop is useful, must be said. I do, I love writing longhand. I, I, I physically enjoy writing longhand. Often at night, particularly at night, I can be absolutely exhausted. So it's 3 a.m. and I have been working since, let's say 10 the previous morning because I've, I've, my waking started to slip because I'm getting nocturnal again. And you think, right, you, you're done. You can barely focus on the thing. So you close the laptop and it's absolutely guaranteed that you'll be halfway up the stairs and another idea will come. Absolutely guaranteed. So I try always to have a notebook in the bedroom because then before I get to bed, I can write it down or I type it into my phone or I will go back to the laptop and open it up. And it depends what sort of an idea it is. If it's something, a, a one-liner, I will put it on my phone. But if it's an idea for a whole space, you know, bit of dialogue, I've got to go back to the laptop. So you do get to a point where your brain is just so 
utterly consumed by it, it's exceptionally hard to shut it down. It's a peculiar thing. You just, you just can't close it off. <laughs>
this will all make sense when people, if people read the book. Um, but yeah, I had to know exactly, and it's a very important final chapter. So um, for the whole series, so yeah, I really needed to know to know where I was working towards, and I don't think, I I doubt any word of that will change. It's it's very well, you know, it's completely formed that chapter. So I think it will remain pretty much exactly as it is.